Today we are looking at a case from the second part of the 19th century. So sit back as we go to Australia. Henry Louis Bertrand was born on the 26th of September 1840. His parents were Henry and Marion Lipschitz, a Jewish couple who had come to England from Belgium. When they arrived, they decided to change their name to Bertrand as it was considered far easier to pronounce. They settled in Mayfair, a very exclusive area, which was mainly occupied by the city's more aristocratic residents, but who were now being joined by those who had gained wealth through means of business and trade, rather than family title or inheritance. Initially, life was good for them in London, but sadly in 1844, Henry Bertrand Sr. passed away at the age of just 31. Seven years later, and still tormented by grief after the loss of her husband, Marion decided to take her family to live in Australia. However, she thought it would be best that her only son, Henry, should stay to finish his schooling before going on to continue the family tradition and study to be a dentist. Over the following years, he studied in London, Brussels and Paris. For those who wanted to travel to Australia in the mid 19th century, the journey was long, taking up to four months to complete. Although some clipper ships traveling in calm seas could do this somewhat quicker, it was also possible to travel by steamship. However, due to the distance from England, these ships were not able to travel the whole journey this way. Instead, the captain would have to combine both steam and wind power in order to get the passengers to Australia. Australia had become a popular place for people to go and welcomed free settlers to its shores. Gold had been discovered in 1851 and at the same time, the economy had significantly improved. This had resulted in even more people migrating there, the majority of who were from Northern Europe. Marion settled in Melbourne and soon met a gentleman named Louis Eskill. Strangely, he too was a dentist, and the following year, in 1852, they married. Not long after the wedding, they moved to Sydney. Over the next few years, she was able to find husbands for her three daughters, Alice, Marion and Josephine, all of whom married well. In 1860, 19-year-old Henry decided to join his family in Australia. He thought that this would be good for him, as his stepfather wanted someone to assist in his dental practice. Henry arrived in Sydney and started to work as a dentist. He soon earned a name for himself. He would tell people that he had been the dentist for Emperor Napoleon himself. He even advertised the fact in the newspaper, the Sydney Morning Herald. He worked very hard and after just 18 months, he ended up taking over the business. In fact, Henry's practice and popularity increased to such an extent that he moved to Wynyard Square, a far better location than the one where he had previously practiced in Hunter Street, and one where he would be able to attract more affluent patients who are in need of dental services. It was around this time that he met Miss Jane Palmer, a very nice young lady who had the reputation of being a person of unblemished character and kindly disposition. Soon after they married and later had two children together, the dental practice continued to do well and Henry was able to provide a very comfortable life for his family. One of the patients who visited his practice was a lady named Miss Maria Ellen Kinder, but who was always known by her second name Ellen. She was from New Zealand. Her father had run a local public house in Auckland where she had met her husband, Mr. Henry Kinder. They were married in 1860 and over the next few years, Ellen gave birth to two children. They then moved to Australia. Henry treated Mrs. Kinder in his practice, and although both married, they seemed to get along very well. In the following weeks, they started to see a lot more of each other. Eventually, they began an affair, with complete disregard for either of their spouses or children. Ellen was no stranger to cheating on her husband, and there were rumours that while living in New Zealand, she had conducted an improper relationship with a sheep farmer named Francis Jackson. Some even said that it was after discovering his wife's infidelity that Mr Kinder turned to drink. By the time they arrived in Sydney, Mrs Kinder's husband, also named Henry, was an alcoholic. He worked as a teller at the city bank, but was experiencing very poor financial circumstances. The couple lived with their two children in a rented cottage in the St Leonard's area of the city. For some reason, Henry Bertrand befriended Mr Kinder and the families became close. They regularly met up and somehow this assisted in covering up the relationship between Henry and Ellen. But Henry started to become obsessed with Ellen 
to the point where he was no longer willing to share her with her husband. He had been planning to divorce his wife so that the pair could be together. However, Ellen would not be able to divorce her husband and it was very unlikely that Mr. Kinder would divorce her. This just added to his frustration and he started to act in quite a peculiar manner. He once forced his dental assistant to row him across the harbour after midnight to spy on her. As time went on, Mr. Bertrand's obsession only intensified and his erratic behaviour also increased. So much so that his dental assistant became concerned for his own safety, especially after Mr. Bertrand had forced him to dress up as a woman and accompany him to purchase a pistol. Following this, the assistant made sure that he was secretly armed at all times. Once he had the pistol, Henry purchased a sheep's head in order to practice shooting. Things took a mysterious twist when the ex-lover of Mrs. Kinder, a gentleman named Mr. Francis Jackson, travelled from Auckland to Sydney. Although quite shocked to learn of the gentleman's arrival, Mr. Henry Bertrand considered that this may be to his advantage. He thought that if Mr. Kinder learned that Mr. Jackson was planning to renew the relationship with his wife, he would become so jealous that he would kill him. He would then be hanged for murder and both Ellen's ex-lover and husband would now be dead. So he and Ellen would be free to live together. However, this did not happen. And eventually Henry gave Mr. Jackson some money and instructed him to return to Auckland. Mr. Jackson agreed, but he did not actually go to New Zealand. Instead, he traveled a hundred miles up the coast and stayed in the city of Maitland. By now, Mr. Henry Bertrand was getting more and more desperate. He so desired to be with Ellen, but she was married and it was going to be difficult for him to be able to be with her. So he came up with a disturbing plan to kill Mr. Kinder and make it appear as if suicide was the cause of his death. On the 2nd of October, 1865, while at the Kinder's cottage, Mr. Bertrand struck up the courage to fire a single gunshot at Mr. Kinder's head. Both his wife, Jane, and his mistress, Ellen, were present at the time. Much to Mr. Bertrand's surprise, the gunshot failed to kill Mr. Kinder and just left the poor man injured. As part of a cover-up, Mr. Bertrand then dressed the wound and sent for a doctor. A doctor and police officer arrived at the house to investigate the incident, and Henry used his convincing personality to persuade them that Mr. Kinder's financial troubles and drinking problems had taken a toll on him, and as a result, he had tried to kill himself. The authorities knew of other similar cases and believed this was probably what had happened. And of course, the gentleman's wife had been in the house along with Mr. and Mrs. Henry Bertrand, Mr. Bertrand being a Sydney dentist with a distinguished reputation. They ruled the incident as an attempted suicide. Henry, however, was no nearer to being able to live with Ellen. His attempt to murder Mr. Kinder had failed, but he now came up with another plan. He concluded that he and Ellen would have to poison Henry Kinder. Mr. Bertrand mixed Belladonna, a commonly known toxic perennial herbaceous plant, with other poisons and added it to a glass of milk. He then convinced Ellen to administer it while her husband was still recovering from the gunshot injury. This time the plan was successful and on the 6th of October 1865, Mr. Henry Kinder died. The coroner looked into his death and after considering the limited evidence and the previously claimed suicide attempts, ruled that there was nothing suspicious. He wrote on the death certificate that the cause of Mr. Kinder's death was suicide. Immediately after his death, Ellen and her children moved into the Bertrands' home, but this arrangement did not last long, as her parents persuaded her to come and live with them in Bathurst, the city in New South Wales, where gold was discovered in the early 1850s that sparked the gold rush. Ellen's mother was very concerned that her daughter needed to save her reputation. Just when it appeared that Henry had got away with this most horrifying crime, he received a letter from Mr. Francis Jackson, the gentleman who had conducted an improper relationship with Ellen years earlier in New Zealand. He had not returned to Auckland and had read about the death of Mr. Henry Kinder in the newspapers. In the letter, Mr. Jackson implied that he knew that Henry had orchestrated the murder and as a result, he would need a payment of £20 in exchange for his silence. Henry did not take the blackmail very well and instead took the letter straight to the police. He stated that a gentleman was trying not only to blackmail him, but also to destroy his reputation. The letter was the only evidence the police needed to arrest Mr. Jackson and at his subsequent trial, 
He was sentenced to 12 months of hard labour. The case had caught the attention of the press and had attracted significant public interest. There were obvious inconsistencies and following the arrest of Mr Francis Jackson, there was pressure on the police to further investigate exactly how Mr Kinder had died. They discovered Mr Henry Bertrand had kept a secret diary which contained details regarding Mr Kinder's death. Additionally, it was discovered that Henry had boasted to his sister, Mrs Harriet Kerr, about how he had got away with murder. Mr Bertrand's dental assistant also provided an array of evidence to the authorities. Upon discovering all this, the police were prompted to exhume the body and conduct an autopsy. During this procedure, the pathologist found poison in Mr Kinder's stomach. This then led to Mr Henry and Mrs Jane Bertrand being charged with murder and Mrs Maria Ellen Kinder being charged as an accessory to murder. By the time the official charges were made, the news of the case had spread beyond Sydney and was being read about in newspapers all over Australia. Mr Bertrand was being dubbed the Mad Dentist of Wynyard Square. The trial began on the 14th of February 1866 at the Sydney Central Criminal Court. The case against the two women ended up being dropped due to the lack of evidence regarding their involvement in Mr Kinder's death. This brought massive public attention and a backlash throughout the country. There was much evidence against the defendant, most of which indicated that his motive for the horrifying crime was due to the strong passion that he felt towards Mrs Kinder. Multiple quotations from his diary were cited during the trial to argue and confirm his guilt. His eccentric manner was also highlighted and it was stated that he had on many occasions boasted about his success with women, his romantic adventures in Brussels and how he had fought a duel in Paris. After the death of her husband, Mrs Kinder had gone to live with her parents in Bathurst and during this time had exchanged many letters with Mr Bertrand. This confirmed without doubt that the couple were involved in an improper relationship and along with the defendant's diary, the evidence seemed to be quite incriminating. The newspapers reported the letters and the Australian public found great amusement in reading their contents. During the trial, Henry's behaviour towards his wife was also highlighted and it was stated that he treated her in a manner not befitting a gentleman. This included a history of violence towards her. Some reports suggested that this cruel treatment towards his wife shocked the public almost as much, if not more, than the manner in which Mr Kinder had died. When the trial ended, Mr Henry Louis Bertrand was found guilty of the murder of Mr Henry Kinder and on the 23rd of February 1866, he was sentenced to death with the execution planned to take place the following month. Luckily for Henry, a lawyer named Julian Salomons successfully managed to get the sentence commuted to life in prison. With her husband now incarcerated, Mrs Jane Bertrand understandably became overwhelmed with the public attention and thus, as a result, took her children and moved to New Zealand. She settled in Auckland as she had relations who lived there. As for Ellen, she wasted no time starting a new life for herself and in 1867 married a man named Humphrey Minchin Carden. Henry spent time in a variety of different jails, including Darlinghurst and the Lunatic Asylum at Parramatta. During his time behind bars, he unexpectedly developed an artistic talent and even played the organ during chapel services. After serving 29 years in prison, he became the longest serving prisoner in New South Wales. He was believed to have been well behaved during his time in prison, with reports indicating that he was found to have only broken one rule during his sentence. On the 17th of June 1894, the justice system declared that Mr Henry Bertrand was no longer a threat to society and as a result, at 53 years old, he was a free man. For the first night of freedom, he was allowed to stay at the Metropole Hotel. However, he was deported on the first available ship for England. After his release, he did not reconcile with his family and he kept a very low profile for the remainder of his life. Although he went to jail as a popular and fashionable man, he came out quite the opposite and rather understandably had a completely ruined reputation. He set himself up in London where he practised as a surgeon and a dentist under the name Mr Edward Henry Burton. In 1902, Henry and his housekeeper named Caroline Ladd moved to Portsmouth. Caroline had been complaining as she believed that she had been poisoned. The same year Caroline passed away 
Despite this, an inquest had found that she had died from natural causes. There was speculation that this was incorrect and that Henry had possibly reoffended. But if this was the case, no evidence of foul play was ever found. Was this right or did Henry reoffend? The answer to this question will likely never be known. On the 11th of September, 1924, Mr. Henry Bertrand died. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.